are there different types of beauty? The research in aesthetics is focused pretty much on an unspecified notion of beauty. So we proceed under the assumption that there are different types of beauty. We specifically addressed the distinction between four categories of aesthetic appeal, namely beauty, elegance, grace, and sexiness. Grace is a kind of old-fashioned term that was very important in classical philosophical aesthetics, has been completely neglected in recent research. Elegance, surprisingly, uh, has not been the subject of a single empirical study to date. Essentially, also, there is no theoretical uh, study on, uh, on elegance uh, available as of now. So we tried to, to distinguish these types of appeal under the assumption that they are all sub variants of the broader notion of beauty. So the founding figure of uh, empirical aesthetics, the German psychologist Gustav Theodor Fechner, maintained uh, that it is very important for aesthetics to use a bottom-up approach. That is, to look at what actual recipients believe, rather than to follow you know, well-established philosophical assumptions. This is exactly what we did. So we picked up the mental model individuals have developed over time of their notion of elegance, of grace, of beauty, uh, and sexiness. This method has, has two aspects. On the one hand, it is exploratory, because in the absence of any theory of elegance, you cannot reasonably predict all dimensions of the perception of elegance. So you develop all sorts of anticipations based on, on historical discourses on, on elegance. These anticipations underlie the selection of the scales you use. And that's a classical method. But there is no top-down, you know, strictly logical approach to it from a theory uh, to uh, the question. Ours is a groundbreaking study that kind of sorts out basic, you know, semantics of the field. But we also go beyond, you know, the uh, understanding of the object end, in that we ask the question, which associations do elegant objects trigger in the perceiver? Wh which values actually are attached to specific aesthetic virtues? We try to, to go into the deeper structure of, uh, of what constitutes the value and which emotions and which you know, response dimensions it elicits in, in recipients. Looking at these four concepts, again, beauty, elegance, sexiness, and grace, it turns out that the, the most common denominator is obviously beauty. Beauty has a strong overlap, overlap with all three other categories. So we have a map, more or less a mind map of these four terms. First of all, uh, we looked into the deep structure, so to speak, of the very construct of elegance. And it turns out uh, that it has a strong overlap with beauty, in that typically elegant things are also beautiful, but it is distinct from beauty, in that it has a pronounced element of cultural sophistication about it. On top of that, there is something like an intellectual rigor in, in beauty, this comes along with a with notion of a profound simplicity. Just think about an elegant dress or think about a, an elegant bridge spanning over miles, but looking like it's a very simple, easy, straightforward thing. Another dimension is kind of a restrained emotionality. Elegance is not hot. It's rather a, a sober category. We also looked into dimensions associated with elegant persons. So it turns out that those uh, who are perceived as elegant also, you know, uh, enjoy a number of other advantages associations. For instance, they are considered to be, to be conscientious, to be intelligent, uh, and to take, actually even to take care of other people, at the same time, they are supposed to be a little bit upper classy. They are uh, uh, su supposed to be successful. All these things come into play if people look 
at elegant persons. These are the, the main findings uh, we made regarding the inherent values associated with uh, elegance. And regarding grace, the important thing is that gracefulness is also available to children and to animals. So gracefulness is very similar to elegance with the exception that it doesn't involve cultural sophistication and it doesn't involve uh, intellectual austerity uh, and this type of emotional restraint. But other than that, object-wise, graceful movements of, of, of children uh, are very similar to elegant movements of, uh, of adult persons. Obviously, sexiness is not dependent on cultural sophistication to the same degree as elegance is. It is not dependent on, on emotional restraint. It's obviously a hot category, whereas elegance can even be a cold category with a reduced temperature. So, to some extent, uh, sexiness is within this spectrum, the very opposite of elegance. In our effort to dissociate elegance and beauty, uh, we also looked into the age distribution uh, between, you know, elegance, sexiness, and grace in individual appearance. And it turns out that there is a, a major difference uh, regarding age distributions. I mean, not surprisingly, uh, sexiness attributions uh, develop more or less at the age of 15, 16, and they rapidly surge. By that time, you find almost no elegance attribution. And the very interesting thing about elegance is that it reaches peak levels only far, uh, far much later in age than beauty and sexiness. And in fact, to some extent, uh, one could say that elegance is a kind of age uh, indifferent type of beauty in that it extends into the highest age of individuals, such that a lady can be called elegant even at age 90. Uh, and so we, we have defined, so to speak, the time windows in which people are perceived as sexy, beautiful and elegant uh, in our study. There is a, there is a research uh, which I personally find very important on negative associations of person perceptions with, uh, uh, with beauty attributions. You may be aware of the fact that everyone feels like he, she or he has to be beautiful, but there's also downsides to it. Specifically, there is a negative co correlation regarding beauty between social competence and beauty. And in, in, in many ways, you know, Persons of outstanding beauty are conceived of as being, I mean, self-centered, as being not generous to other persons, and as being to, to some extent difficult. That's something it, you, you mean already Sigmund Freud has reported. And now for elegance, however, we do, we do find very different results. Interestingly, we find that persons of elegance uh, enjoy the attribution not only of high intelligence and, and social standing, but also of positive social virtues. I have to admit this was kind of surprising to, to me, but the result is fairly robust. We, we have already you know, started um, research that looks into a broader picture. In this case, we also include the very opposite of elegance. In our understanding, it's actually kitsch. Elegance is the most austere type of beauty. Kitsch is the least austere type of beauty. And we, we look into uh, the neural underpinnings of these two types of beauty. Hopefully, that will enable us to debunk, to some extent, the notion that beauty is a kind of homogenous entity. People associate kitsch clearly with beautiful, and they also associate elegance with beautiful. Now, what we do is we develop a, norm, a normed stimulus set, a collection of items uh, which are rated as either kitschy or elegant or beautiful in, in, uh, by, by most people. Have, so, so that is, we need a convergent perception 
of a set of stimuli. Once we have secured that stimulus set, we have a good basis for investigating uh, in a more theoretical fashion. So what we did in a more explorative fashion in, uh, in our very first study on elegance.